who is the Conservative candidate, Simon Cross, who is the Green candidate, Ian Gilbert, who is the Labour candidate, and Peter Guisdala, who is the Liberal Democrat candidate. We uh, invited the candidate for UKIP to attend tonight, but he made it plain very early on that he had a clashing appointment, and so we've accepted his apologies. We've had a lot of questions submitted to this hustings, uh, far more than we could reasonably hope to deal with in a single evening. So uh, the team which has put the event together has looked at the questions, has tried to edit them down to bare essentials, and we've got 13 or so questions tonight, which uh, I'll be inviting the candidates to address in turn. Uh, we will be asking each of the candidates in a moment to speak for no more than three minutes to present the reasons why we might wish to vote for them. There's someone here keeping time, uh, and candidates uh, uh, will have a warning uh, when they're coming close to the end of their time for speaking, uh, and uh, I've been given the enviable right to cut the candidates off if they go on too long, or to inter interrupt if uh, I feel that perhaps they're not really addressing the question. And so uh, I'm going to begin now by inviting James Dudridge uh, to speak to us for his three minutes as to why uh, constituents in Rochford and South End East should vote Conservative at the election. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is James Dudridge. I've been a Member of Parliament uh, for 10 years, and I'm asking for a renewal of contract, effectively, and asking you to re-elect me as your Member of Parliament. Uh, re-elect me specifically because I live locally, I campaign hard, I'm sure I get lots of things wrong, as most of us do in our everyday jobs. It's difficult to get the right mix between uh, spending time in the National Parliament and helping out with individuals' problems but hopefully I get that right most of the time. I've helped over 20,000 people on individual constituency cases that have either visited me in my surgery uh, just down the road or places like the frying pan fish and chip shop uh, opposite. Um, I've led campaigns on the cancer center. I've brought back our driving test center, a uh, campaign on radioactive waste around concerns over Foulness Island, a campaign around train horn noise, which while sounded trivial, was keeping up thousands of people in the constituency overnight, and many more campaigns that I haven't just led, but also supported. But also I'd ask you not to vote for me, James Dudridge, but to vote for David Cameron to go to number 10 Downing Street. And if I leave you with one question and one impression for when you go into the, the, the ballot box, is that question is, who do I want running the economy for the next five years? And I think if you phrase that question, I think more people uh, consider that actually voting for the Conservatives to finish the job that we started makes good economic sense uh, for our future and continue the plan that we got to sort out this country. We turned it round, but we certainly haven't finished the job. Vote Conservative on the 7th of May. Thank you ever so much. Good. Thank you for that. I invite uh, Simon Cross. Now for the Green Party. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for, um, for coming out tonight, uh, for turning out to listen to a little bit more um, about uh, the importance of this election. I can't stress enough, and I've said this before, this is by far and away the most important general election in this country for around 40 years. It's a chance to actually change the way that we do things. But in actual fact, there is only one party in this country that is offering that chance for change. Austerity has failed. It's failed 95% of the people in this country. You may think you're well off, but another five years of this, you may think again. What the Green Party is promising and what I'm offering is first of all, a better and fairer deal for the people of South End. But what we're really offering underneath all of that is five things. First of all, warm, affordable, comfortable housing. And that's for everybody. 
That's for everybody who is currently sleeping rough, people who are sofa surfing, young people who can't afford to get on the property ladder. That's what we're offering. We're also offering an end to the use of food banks. A million people using food banks, more than half of them working people. We're offering an end to that. We need everybody to be able to put a good, honest meal on the table. We're also offering a change to the education system. The education of this country is failing our children and it's failing our future. The fourth thing that we're offering, and we're offering this absolutely open-handedly, with no fear, we will protect the NHS. The NHS is not for sale, not to anybody. We will buy everything back out of private hands and the NHS will be run as it was supposed to, free at the point of use. And finally, all the things that were sold off under Thatcher's privatisation, we'll buy them back for you and they'll work for you. That's what the Green Party is offering and that's where we differ from everybody else on this platform tonight. So I ask you to vote Green. Thank you. Uh, Ian Gilbert for Labour. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you to the organisers of this evening's event. It's uh, great to see so many people here to uh, uh, discuss and think about the big issues that our country and our town faces. Uh, my name's Ian Gilbert, I'm the Labour Party candidate. Uh, I've lived in Southend for about 14 years now, and whilst I've been involved in politics from an early age, uh, I've, I'm not what you would call a career politician. I've worked at a small business in Southend uh, for, for the time I've been here. I'm not the sort of person who goes around seeking, uh, seeking seats uh, to win. I'm here and I want to do the best for people in Rochford and South End East. Uh, my number one priority at this election uh, is to sort out the National Health Service. Uh, and the Labour Party is the only party that have not only said uh, that they would commit more money uh, to the National Health Service, uh, but also set out exactly how it was going to be funded uh, and taking the, the tough decisions like uh, a tax on properties uh, valued over to two million pounds, uh, which, you know, it's not an easy thing to do and there are people lobbying against it, but we need to get more money uh, to sort out our National Health Service and also because I see the things that a, uh, a local MP could actually do to sort out some of the, the problems that, that we've got in our services locally. Uh, we warned that the uh, Health and Social Care Act would actually make things worse rather than better. Uh, I spoke to a nurse on the campaign trail just today uh, who was telling me about the problems that she faced and how difficult it was to get anything done in the health service because the governance has become so fragmented uh, under the Conservatives. Uh, another issue that I'm very concerned about is uh, cuts to our local police service. Uh, we've also already seen two police stations close in this constituency. Uh, we've seen hundreds of officers uh, off the beat, uh, hundreds of officers lost, uh, and it's quite clear from looking at the Conservatives' uh, economic plans that uh, these cuts uh, will continue if, uh, if they are re-elected. And whilst a number of crimes are down uh, in South End and across the country, uh, right here in South End we're seeing a worrying trend in violent crime, which is up 20% uh, in the past year, which I know people who live in Curzel Ward round here will know uh, the effects and they will know the, the fear that that is, uh, that, that, that is causing. Um, so, um, yes, as I said, I'm, I'm not a career politician. I've been lucky enough to be elected to the local council and to have been part working alongside my good colleagues like Councillor Judith McMahon and Councillor Ann Jones to be part of some of the success that we've had in the local council in changing things recently. So, thank you. Finally, Peter Costana for the Liberal Democrats. 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Gwistar, and thank you very much for such a warm welcome here tonight. So, why vote for the Lib Dems? Well, let me put it this way. If you vote for Labour, they haven't learned their lesson. There will be another period of failed policies. If you vote for the Conservatives, then with a Conservative majority government, you'll have further swinging cuts, which will hurt the poorest in society. In 2010, the country was on its knees. Not in church, but it was on its knees because we'd been taken to the brink of bankruptcy. The Lib Dems in government had to make very, very hard decisions and have ameliorated the excesses of the Conservative Party and have made it a, a better place. Yes, it's hurt, but it, it would have been a lot worse without the Lib Dems in government. The bedroom tax. Amendments have been made to that which have protected the most needy. The pupil premium has helped those who need it most, those children uh, who are on free school meals. We've increased the personal uh, tax allowance. That's given a tax cut of £800 per annum to 24 million people. And tuition fees, and I thought I'd mention it before you do, um, the cap that had been placed on that, and don't forget that it was the Labour government who instigated the Brown Report, which recommended that there would be no cap on tuition fees. And it was actually also the Labour government who introduced tuition fees. So it was the Lib Dems who put the cap on it. Now there's more to come. £8 billion for the NHS, fully costed, unlike the Labour Party or the Greens, Two and a half billion pounds for schools to, again, fully costed to protect education from two years to 19 years. 200,000 new apprenticeships. Youth unemployment has gone down in the past five years under the coalition government. And also 300,000 new homes for those who need it most. So, if you want more food banks in South End, if you want more unemployment, then please vote for one of these other candidates here. But if you don't want extremes, but a party that is anchored in the centre ground and providing sensible policies, then please vote Lib Dem on the 7th of May. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you uh, to the candidates for their opening statements. Uh, we now come to the questions uh, that we've scheduled for this evening. Uh, there are 13 questions. We will vary the order in which we invite the candidates to respond to them. They will have 60 seconds to respond. It's not a long time, so their responses, gentlemen, they'll need to be to the point. 60 seconds, and you'll have a 10-second warning when you are close to that uh, deadline. And so we begin. Over Easter, the Prime Minister reasserted his view that this is a Christian country. Does the panel think this means anything, and does it matter? James. Uh, yes, it does matter. Um, yes, it does mean something. Although I think we need to recognise that a diminishing number of people uh, identify themselves as Christians, 55% of of this constituency identify themselves, including myself, as a, a Christian. And that's not to say we're being overtaken by other uh, religions. The Jewish community in Rochester and South End East is less than 2%. The Muslim community is less than 2%. The Hindu community is uh, considerably less uh, than 1%. And, and no other religion really uh, uh, figures on the Richter scale. However, what it means to be a Christian, I think, is changing. Um, and I think we need to reevaluate that. Uh, both um, as a, a community more generally uh, and the church. And when I meet with church groups, um, I think that's a process that's uh, all, already going ahead. And um, I think that will, will continue, but it certainly does mean something. Thank you. And uh, Simon? Yeah, this is quite an interesting question. Um, I tend to find myself uh, with a foot in two camps here. First of all, yes, this is a Christian country. Uh, but my, my main thrust on this is that um, I have always appreciated people's faith. And whilst the uh, predominance in this country is for Christianity, 
There are many, many other faiths that exist in this country. And what we have to do is we have to accept that everybody should have a right and, uh, and be allowed to practice their faith in peace and in harmony, uh, that the faith should work together, uh, certainly in times of crisis when we're facing such abject poverty. And I've seen many examples of this. But there are also people who don't have a specific faith. And I think it's important to recognize them as well. So yes, while this is a Christian country, I think that it's important to remember that people should be allowed to practice any faith that they choose in peace, in tranquility. Thank you for that. Ian. Thank you. I, I tend not to talk about uh, my own personal uh, uh, religious views because I don't, you know, I don't feel qualified to talk to, to people who have, uh, who, who are you know, ministers of religion and whatever about matters of faith. However, um, I do have enormous respect for the work that uh, uh, people of faith do in this, uh, this country and particularly here uh, with the work that the churches together have done in uh, running the, the food bank that, 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 that operates from here and from the plaza and from other other churches uh, in the town. Um, so I value the importance of faith uh, and the importance of those who have faith in our community. But I think whenever politicians uh, try to define a set of values, they always end up coming unstuck. So I prefer to leave matters of religious faith to those who are more qualified to talk about it. Thank you. <laughs> and Peter. Well, the question was particularly him. Is that working? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, the question was: uh, Is this a Christian country, and does it matter? Well, yes, of course it matters, and it matters even more so in this uh, <coughs> world that we live in now. Um, any faith is, for me, a question of tolerance. Believing in looking after your fellow man, no matter what faith they have, or indeed if they have no faith. So, for me, it's very important that um, the, the principles of tolerance and acceptance of others are engendered in our political life. I think that um, we need uh, the leadership from our uh, churches uh, and mosques and uh, synagogues more so now than at any other time. Thank you. Now, though we meet in a church and uh, we've begun with a question that relates to, to Christianity, um, most of the rest of the questions do not come with a particular uh, slant. Um, and, and so let's plunge into the next one, which is <coughs> a more general uh, theme, which is this. Should teachers follow the advice of one of our local head teachers and ignore the requirement to teach British values upon which schools will be judged? I'll read that again. Should teachers follow the advice of one of our local head teachers and ignore the requirement to teach British values upon which schools will be judged? This is one of my hot topics, education. Um, I actually think that schools, uh, in actual fact, should be run by a combination of the heads and the teachers. And I think that what is taught in those schools uh, should not come under the umbrella of a national curriculum. I don't think there should be any doubt whatsoever that every single child is an individual. And that learning and teaching should be tailored and structured to make sure that every child can achieve the highest level that they ever possibly can because that is the future of our country. And in actual fact, the children in this country did nothing to cause the problems that we have now. And in that case, they should be given that opportunity when it's their turn to follow on from what we are trying to do and to put things right. And for that, you need a strong education. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and Ian, please. Thank you. I think it's right that we set uh, certain uh, standards uh, and uh, certain expectations of our schools uh, nationally. You know, I don't think it's unreasonable for politicians to say 
uh, every child should be able to uh, read, write, uh, and, and have certain other knowledge by the time they leave school. I think most parents would accept that as being proper and, and reasonable. But as I said in my answer to my last question, I think where politicians try to define values, they often end up getting into a bit of a mess. Uh, so whilst I wouldn't uh, all urge any teacher to ignore the requirements of the government, uh, I would urge the government of whatever colour uh, to think again and uh, not to have too rigid an interpretation of, of the kind of values that a school should teach. Peter, please. Well, I think um, it really depends on what we mean by uh, British values. Uh, referring to my previous answer, if we're talking about tolerance, acceptance of others, helping uh, the weaker and more needy in society, then if those are the values that are passed down by the government, then yes, we should follow them. And uh, finally, James. Um, I suppose there are two parts to this question. One is around British values, and should they be taught in our school? And the other is around head teachers and uh, whether we should take their advice. Firstly, on British values, I'm sympathetic to the, the, the lack of definition of what that meant, and I'm unfamiliar with which school it is in, in the constituency. I think purposely it's not not be mentioned which school school it is. Um, but having uh, teaching values alongside a core curriculum I think is absolutely essential. Um, and one of the great things that you, you take away from school, actually taking those values of that school alongside the core education. However, also I believe in trusting head teachers. Um, there's no point having highly qualified, highly paid people. I'm quite sympathetic to Simon's argument that it should be much more individually uh, run. I would argue that there does need to be a core curriculum, but in terms of the values that are taught, the style, the way things are taught, I think there should be a degree of flexibility and we should trust heads. Very good. Well, thank you for your answers. So just as a straw poll uh, from the audience, um, do we think that British values should be taught in our schools? Do you, would you, if you agree, put your hand up. What are the values? Oh, oh, if, you, if you disagree, if you disagree, let's have a show of hands. And if you don't know, let's have a further, let's have a further show of hands. A, a lot of thank you for your hands. Uh, an animated response. It seemed to me, just looking around the audience, that a significant number, both with the show of hands and vocally as well. Um, <laughs> would like a closer definition of what British values are. So something for our candidates perhaps to take away with them and to reflect on for the rest of the campaign. Our third question uh, is this. Imagine you are elected and go on to win the ballot of MPs and the opportunity to introduce a private member's bill. What bill would you seek to pass and why? So again, imagine you are elected and go on to win the ballot of MPs and the opportunity to introduce a private member's bill. What bill would you seek to pass and why? And just to give the candidates, they haven't seen these questions, a moment to collect their thoughts. Perhaps uh, after they've responded, I'll ask uh, for two or three, four people in the audience uh, what topic they would put forward if they were elected as our MP. So, Ian, would you kick us off with a response to this one? Please? Right. Well, obviously, if I was elected here, I would hope that the, the big issues that I want to tackle in terms of reforms of the NHS, scrapping the bedroom tax, etc., would be dealt with by uh, government bills. But the thing that I, I feel particularly strongly about uh, and particularly affects us is housing. Um, I would want to strengthen the laws to make uh, landlords uh, in the private sector um, take better care of their housing, uh, give better security to tenants uh, and find measures to increase the supply of social housing. Peter, how about you? Well, the thing for me, I'd be uh, introducing a private member's bill to make the use of uh, 
green energy, solar energy on all new builds compulsory, and also any planning application um, that was put in uh, throughout the UK uh, would have to have a green element in it. James, please. If, if I'd won the ballot last time round, I would have uh, supported the bill James Wharton did, which was an in-out referendum on Europe. But following Ian's lead, I'll assume that an incoming Conservative government's delivering that in 2017. Um, and I would look at uh, perhaps introducing a balanced budget act uh, so that over uh, the economic cycle, uh, the budget balance, we start paying down our debt. So governments of all different colours couldn't get ourselves into the mess that we've done, not just in, under the last Labour government, historically over the last 20, 30 years. Thank you. And finally, Simon, please. For those who know me, uh, this is going to sound a little bit dry, but I promise you it's not. I would absolutely totally love to introduce a bill uh, that, withdrew, that withdrew the necessity for a parliamentary whip for any parliamentary party. I would absolutely and totally make it impossible for a party to decide how its members vote. That would absolutely and totally ensure that every single MP that you ever elect would have your interests at heart and not the interests of its party. It would give a lot more freedom and flexibility for a local MP to make his choice based on local issues and based on what local people tell him. So that would be my bill. Sorry it couldn't be a bit funnier. <laughs> Okay, did they get it right? What would you choose if you were in that position of being able to put forward a private member's bill? So, the lady down at the front, very briefly, please. Um, working in the NHS, and I have done for many years as a registered nurse, my bill would be to stop and reverse all the privatisation okay. that is actually crippling the NHS. Recently, Thank you. So, the, the lady proposes a bill to reverse privatisation yeah. in the NHS. Yeah. And uh, over there, thank you, yes, gentleman with the glasses. Yes, uh, I would show that the gave consideration to people across the stand night by conservative airport before 10am on Sunday morning. Okay, okay. thank you, you, sir. Gentleman in the uh, uh, salmon t-shirt. Uh, freedom of conscience, Bill. A lot of people are suffering from their conscience, whether or not they believe uh, in something, whether it may be abortion or it may be uh, something along those lines, they don't want to be forced to work and do that. They're losing their jobs because their conscience says, I cannot do it. Okay, thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Christian, for that, there, please. Education, protecting children to be taught by unqualified teachers, which Mr. Bedford has fortunately not addressed. Two more, perhaps. The lady in the front row here, please. Uh, I would like to stop uh, TTIP. It's an incredibly Okay, thank you. And uh, the lady proposes a bill to stop TTIP. Now, this is where I display some ignorance. It's a trade. It's a trade agreement. Transatlantic trade. Very good. Okay. Yeah, I, you've made your point. Thank you. And uh, finally, um, who haven't? It's a gentleman right at the back. That's it. Uh, yes, please. Sir. Um, so to to, uh, to get rid of racist laws against cannabis and to free up our hemp industry. That's an interesting blend of bills that are going to come forward in the next parliament. The um, yeah yeah I'll, I'll make the jokes I think. On that. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for your contributions. Question four says this. What is the just and fair thing to do? Ask someone who has £400 disposable income at the end of the month to contribute more, 
or to ask someone who has no disposable income at the end of the month to live on even less. Peter, please. That's a fantastic question. <laughs> and whilst I think of an answer, I'll just stall a little bit for time. The, um, the, the answer is, unfortunately, that both are true. Uh, both are fair and just. Obviously, those who can afford more uh, should pay more, and it's um, noticeable that the uh, Conservative Party uh, don't wish to tax higher uh, any of the millionaires, multi-millionaires who support them. Um, at the same time, everybody has to uh, share the brunt of the disastrous situation that we were put in uh, by the previous Labour government over 13 years. Now, I know people don't like hearing that, but yeah, it's very easy to blame the uh, past coalition government, but the fact of the matter is that we were put in that position and we need to uh, continue to uh, address it. Thank you. Uh, James, please. I'm not sure why the figures 400 and north were um, chosen specifically, but I'll, I'll take, take it as someone with money and someone without money. Clearly, someone with more money should be paying a lot more tax. The rich should be paying a lot more tax, and they have done over the last five years in absolute terms. Um, because the economy is growing uh, and uh, so forth, they're not actually paying more tax in percentage terms, but that's, that's good news over, overall that they're, they're paying. And, and perhaps um, you know, with our, our Liberal Democrat partners in, co in coalition, one of the things we have done is raised a large number of people totally out of tax entirely, um, up to £12,500 you'll be able to earn without paying tax. So you'll end this ridiculous position whereby people earning the minimum wage can still be paying taxation. So the rich should be paying more tax. They are already, however, paying more tax. Simon, please. I'd like to answer this in two ways. Uh, the other day, I did some uh, rough mathematics, uh, but they're fairly accurate. If you took every single penny of assets and wealth that 92% of the poorest people in this country have, it would buy the assets of the richest 8%. Now, I think that is an absolute, inalienable disgrace. But the other thing is, and Mr. Dudridge has just led like, very nicely onto this, Mr. Dudridge is trying to indicate that this country has got gradually wealthier. So I'd like him, at some point this evening, to explain why three and a half million working families in this country are living in poverty, and why over half a million of them are using food banks. And Ian, please. Thank you. I'll find it hard to answer the actual question as asked because I'm, I'm not sure why those particular figures were picked. Obviously, uh, the, as, as David Cameron said back in the early days, those with the broadest shoulders should uh, carry the heaviest burden. Unfortunately, the reality of what we've seen over the last uh, five years is anything but. We've seen the Conservatives cut corporation tax, uh, cut uh, tax for top earners, increase VAT, which is paid for by all of us, rich and poor, and raising the tax threshold, you know, it's, it's a nice thing to do, but it only makes a few pence worth of difference to most people because they weren't paying very much tax in the first place. So, yes, we, the, the, the people with the broadest shoulders should bear the, broad, should bear the heaviest burdens, and that's a principle I will stick to. <laughs> Thank you. Now, question five attends to a similar theme uh, in that it asks this. If you are elected as our MP, will you support or oppose the current regime of sanctions against people receiving benefits? Will you support or oppose the current regime of sanctions against people receiving benefits? James, please. Um, I would support the, the current regime. Uh, when I was made redundant, as part of the redundancy package I was given, um, I had uh, professional support to find a new job. And when I visited some of the professional groups that were providing people support to get back into work, it was very similar to that which I was provided for. for. 
uh, by the private sector. Um, I think there needs to be opportunities to get back into work, but as part of that contract between people uh, that we have as a state, uh, there should be a downside to not participating in that process. That's only fair to uh, hard-working taxpayers. And in fact, I would not go further. I would um, reduce the, uh, the, the, the benefits cap by several thousand pounds. The fact that people on benefits can earn as much as hard-working families, I think, is inequitable. There, sh there should be a differential between uh, people that earn money and people that are paid benefits. It should be less. Thank you. And Simon, please. Very central to the core of Green Party uh, philosophy and strategy is fairness. Uh, when people are sanctioned, it, is, uh, it doesn't even follow the pattern of the British justice system. People are sanctioned for absolutely no reason. They are found guilty and forced to prove themselves innocent. I don't believe that there are that many people in this country who are fiddling our benefits system. So I think it is the, the purpose of the state to prove that these people are not entitled to the benefits that they are. And I think that the worst sanctions of all are sanctions against the disabled and their carers. So Centre to Green's strategy is that sanctioning will end tomorrow. You elect us tomorrow, we'll end sanctions. <laughs> Without doubt uh, and unequivocally, I oppose the current regime. I do not agree with Simon to the sense that there should be uh, no conditionality in the welfare state. That's we what all I said. You said you'd end sanctions. Yes, uh, we all conditionality is different. We all we all say that the, the idea that those people who can work should work is at the core of our system. That's how the welfare state has always been, and we cannot move away from that. However, the current targets, which despite all denials, do exist uh, within, uh, within the job centre, within the DWP, uh, we know they exist. It is wrong, it is cruel, it is inhumane, and we will end it. And finally then, Peter. It's what um, President Bill Clinton said, um, it's the economy, stupid. And everything that you want, absolutely everything comes from a prosperous economy. We can't have um, greater benefits, we can't have better job prospects for our young, we can't have better health care, uh, or better mental uh, health care for our population without a strong economy. So I would support uh, continued sanctions, but I would fight hammer and nail to make sure that they're fairer, so that the disabled aren't penalised, so that people with mental health issues aren't penalised. Um, I think it's very important that we help people get back into work and support them whilst they are finding work and um, with things such as the universal credit. Absolutely important to have sanctions but for those to be fair. Thank you. We come now to two questions which uh, uh, relate to health, and the first of them is this. A cancer facility at South End Hospital is under threat of relocation to cut costs. How would your party ensure adequate funding for the NHS? Simon. Our party will absolutely totally guarantee that we will fully fund the NHS. We're not going to make up these protestations and ridiculous nonsensical notions that there are 5,000 doctors out there looking for a job, or 8,000 nurses, or 12,000 midwives. What we're going to do is we're going to give the NHS the money it needs to continue, to put the services where people need them. We're also going to absolutely totally guarantee we make a preferred employer, and we start from the grassroots and start training our doctors and nurses again. But we cannot succeed without people coming from overseas to fill the void while we train new doctors and nurses. And if you hear anybody on this platform tonight tell you that there are doctors and nurses out there looking for work, this year so far, due to deaths and due to retirements, we've lost 38 GPs in, in, in the Essex area. And in actual fact, there is nobody queuing up to fill those vacancies. We All that's done is put okay. additional strain on those practices. This needs to end. Thank you. 
Thank you. As I said, the Labour Party has a fully costed plan uh, to train more nurses, more doctors and more care assistants. Um, and I, I have to know that Simon said all that, but he didn't set out a single way in which that would be paid for. Uh, we have said uh, we will introduce a tax on properties over £2 million. Uh, we will introduce an additional levy on tobacco companies and we will increase... I don't think it's a shame, actually. And we will increase, uh, and we will increase fines for tax avoidance. Uh, these aren't popular, you know, with some people. They will upset some vested interests, uh, but it is absolutely necessary to get the investment in the NHS that it needs. Uh, David Cameron said he, you can't fund the NHS on an IOU. He's completely correct. We're not giving the NHS an IOU. We're giving it real costed funding. We'll come back to the rebuttal in a minute if you want to do that. Now, Peter, please. Okay, there, there are two sides to this um, question. Um, let me first just very briefly talk about the, uh, the cancer facility. Um, I mean, South End is um, almost at the end of the earth. Geographically, it's very difficult, so um, hard decisions have to be taken uh, whether to move that facility. Um, it might be a better idea to move the consultants here uh, when they're required and have um, uh, treatment here. Um, on the uh, funding of the NHS, the Lib Dem, Liberal Democrats have fully costed £8 billion by the end of uh, the next Parliament, which is what Simon Stevens, uh, Chief Executive of NHS England, has asked for. Um, and we've also uh, earmarked, again, fully costed £500 million for mental health care, and that is an absolutely fundamental issue for our nation and so many other of the ails, ailments of this nation come from uh, poor mental health care. Firstly on funding, um, NHS funding was around 100 billion when we took over. That has increased to 113 billion, which kept pace with inflation. Uh, under the next parliament, we're going to increase um, health funding by 8 billion over the rate of inflation. In relation to the issue of cancer care, uh, the cancer care debate is somewhat different to that which is being presented in the paper and different to the cancer care Teddy Taylor thought and I thought was it's about cancer totally. This is about urology only and it's not just about all urology, it's about a particular type of surgery. It's about a particular type of surgery which is only day surgery. Um, you then have to have continued care which would be in South End. There's about 50 incidents of that surgery per year in South End, and another 50 that are done in South End. And the decision hasn't been taken as to whether it will be based in Colchester or South End. So we were right to fight for our cancer centre, and the Echo were right to run the campaign. But the more and more we look at it, actually, it's nowhere near as impactful as the previous Save Our Cancer Centre campaigns would have been. Because if uh, we'd had a merger across the whole of Essex of all cancers, that would have been very significant and led to a real patient flow, which people don't want. They don't want to go all the way up to Chancellor or into London okay. uh, for their chemotherapy and radiotherapy. <laughs> Thank you. Now, um, we're running ahead of time, so I'm going to suggest two things. Firstly, uh, that on this particular topic, if candidates want to comment on what's been said by uh, other candidates, let's give them... 30 seconds each to do that, uh, and then for the remaining questions, we'll move to a minute and a half, so 90 seconds uh, for responses for the re remaining questions, which hopefully will give uh, those who are standing for office to uh, the opportunity to, um, to give a, uh, a more developed and rounded answer. So uh, if you want to uh, offer a comment on what's been said on this particular topic on the cancer facility at Southend Hospital, Let's do it in the same order. Simon, did you want to say something? No, but I want to actually answer Mr Gilbert's um, uh, point regarding where the money's coming from. Um, the Green Party fully intend not to renew Thrive, which will save us over the next few years £100 billion uh, on something that is never used versus the NHS, which is used every day uh, by in excess of 3 million people. And secondly, uh, tax evasion in this country has got to such a ridiculous level that we know for a fact that we can generate at least £56 billion 
just from closing tax loopholes. And we've started to do this. The other thing is, our manifesto has been identified by a number of August bodies okay. as being the only fully costed manifesto they have ever Thank seen. Thank you. I'll stop you there. Thank you for that. It seems to me he was commenting on what you said, Ian. Did you want to come back um, on that? Trident we can, is, is a very long subject. We can have a long discussion about that. But just on, just go on tax evasion. You know, uh, I want to cut clamp down on tax evasion, you know, I think possibly, you know, even some Conservatives might want to clamp down on tax evasion, though that's less clear. Uh, but one, th but, one, but one, thing that, one thing that I am certain about is that it's not an easy thing to do. We have to do, it, it, it's a, a process of clawing money back, a few hundred thousand pounds at a time. It needs international agreements, it needs increased funding for HMRC. Uh, it needs a lot of steps which actually ca cannot be implemented on day one. So if Simon is saying that we can fund the NHS on day one, okay. uh, with through coming down on tax evasion, that is simply Thank not you. true. Okay. Peter, just 30 seconds, please. Well, I think I've had my 30 seconds used up elsewhere, but very briefly, I'm, I'm, I'm not a professional politician. I'm frankly quite shocked that none of the candidates mentioned mental health care. It's absolutely okay. fundamental. Okay. Sort of that okay. I'm really, really upset. Thank you. By it. Thank you. And uh, I think James, you've waived your your uh, right to, to come back for a, a further bite of this one. We're moving on to question number seven, which is about mental health care. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't seen the questions. Um, the mental health service in Rochford and South End is incredibly oversubscribed. For example, a high proportion of rough sleepers in our towns are thought to have a mental health issue. How will you ensure that people with mental ill health receive the services they need? Ian. Thank you. This is a, a desperately important question. and The only reason that I didn't mention mental health before was that that actually wasn't the question. Um, I, I feel that, uh, I mean, I, I've spoken to a lot of bodies that work with the homeless in South End, people like Hart, etc., uh, and, and they say that actually getting help for people with mental problems is one of the, the biggest uh, challenges they face in getting somebody rehoused. It's, it's an incredibly difficult uh, problem to solve. Um, part of the, the reason why the people fought so hard against the Health and Social Care Act was because it would fragment decision making in the NHS and make it harder to actually solve local problems. Um, I think that's exactly what we're, what we're seeing. Um, in order to, you know, the, the overlapping functions between the Council, uh, NHS England uh, and the CCG make it very, very difficult to actually CCG, address it. CCG? Sorry, CCG, Clinical Commissioning Group, the, okay. the group of doctors which commission services in South End. So I think we do need a change of structure. And James talks about the numbers uh, in terms of funding of the NHS. And all I would say is that if that's true, and, you know, and I'm sure the numbers are there, that actually NHS hasn't been cut, that makes it all the more remarkable that we have seen such a crisis in the NHS over the past few years. Uh, and it, if it's not down to lack of funding, it must be down to poor management. Okay, thank you for that. Peter. Recently, £500 million ring fence for mental health care. Yes, you've just witnessed a miracle. A politician has answered a question. Don't know. Um, the, the longer answer is that. Um, it's not just um, rough sleepers who are um, facing, uh, or a large proportion of them are suffering from mental health issues. That starts a lot earlier. Um, I was an army officer, uh, I'm still a reservist, and uh, there are so many ex-military people who suffer from uh, mental health care because the support uh, systems are not there for when they leave the service. But going even um, before that, a lot of mental health issues start in childhood. And that 500 million pounds promised by the Lib Dems will focus on treating mental health issues from the start and not letting them uh, get worse as time goes on. Thank you. James. I think certainly 
recognising that mental health should be treated like physical health issues. Uh, Mind ran a very successful campaign nationally to say a third of people at some point uh, will have a mental health problem. I actually think that's inaccurate. Uh, I think it's much higher than that. Um, and rather like autism having a scale, uh, mental health has a scale. Intuitively, we all have good days and bad days. Um, and I think mental health extends along that same scale to, to, the, to, to greater <coughs> extremities. Um, we've got a very good uh, facility in Rochford Hospital for mental health, um, and that integrates well within the community. Uh, the, the, the Taylor Centre has changed in the way it's provided services, um, but uh, it, it's a, a powerful uh, body. I've worked very closely with groups like Mind Locally, which are separate to Mind Nationally, uh, Rethink, uh, and, and MenCap, and in fact have been involved with some of their boards and was a trustee of SHIELDS, uh, which focuses on learning disabilities as well as uh, mental health in the community. But the key thing is treating mental health in a similar same way to physical health, not only in terms of perception, but also going forward in terms of funding. Thank you. And sorry. I've thought long and hard about this, and I remember some years ago when I was selling a, an antidepressant that I used to call on community mental health teams. This was after the, uh, this idea of care of the community. Uh, community mental health teams were absolutely wonderful organisations. I enjoyed my time talking to them. Uh, a lot of those have disappeared. In fact, I think most of them have disappeared. And I think the answer to this question has, has two strands. The first strand is the third sector, uh, people who deal with the homeless, people who deal with the mind, um, uh, a lot of the mental health charities need to be given provision of funding to actually identify and triage these people who are in difficulty, whether they be homeless, whether they be just people living at home, whether they be individuals who have, have been missed by the system. But the second thing is, we need a community mental health team in every single community in this country. There's no two ways about it, they're the best people to deal with it, they're the best place, and government just never ever listens Okay. Question 8 says this. The House of Lords has been considering a bill to legalise assisted suicide or euthanasia. And it is likely that there will be renewed efforts by some in the next Parliament to pass such legislation. How would the candidates vote if such a bill comes to the House of Commons? Peter. Um, in my view, um, the sanctity of life is paramount, but as a member of parliament you have to represent the views of your constituents. Now, there may be many people out there who feel that um, assisted suicide is a, a thing that they would be in favour of. Um, so whilst personally it's something that I am not in favour of. At the end of the day, that's my choice. And it's the choice for those individuals who are in such a position that they have to make uh, that, that terrible decision. Um, what I would seek to do is amend the bill to ensure that there are safeguards there. That um, it's very easy you know, to, to find a doctor or two who will sign the, um, the papers to allow that to happen. I would ask for a, a, a register of doctors trained, and it would require not just two doctors, but three doctors to confirm that the person was uh, in the final stages of life before um, it would be possible to administer any um, uh, lethal doses. Okay. Thank you. James, please. Um, I haven't previously supported an assisted suicide uh, bill. Um, I'm not aware of any that I would support in detail. However, if this isn't a contradiction, I would support the principle of supporting people uh, in taking their own lives if that was the right thing. Uh, however, some of the complexities that have been drawn out already, there are many, many others to give the right protections. Um, my grandmother, who's no longer with us, I know there was a time of her life when her husband died, my grandfather, she immediately wanted to take her own life. And I don't think she was thinking things through at that stage. However, late on in her, her life, um, in her last few weeks, she was in a lot of pain. 
um, and she wanted to take her own life. I think in that case, um, it perhaps would have been the, the right thing for her to be able to do that in a controlled uh, way. Um, but I'm not seeing legislation that brings about that level of balance and, and subtlety to the argument. But I hope we can, can thrash it out. And it's one of the areas that the House of Lords perhaps can have a slightly more nuanced and, and mature uh, and experienced d debate. Uh. Thank you. <coughs> Simon, please. I now find myself in a remarkably rare situation. I find myself uh, not being able to give you uh, uh, an answer to this question without being disingenuous. Um, I have my own personal views on, on assisted death. Uh, I don't want to give the answer that I think you may wish to hear. Um, my possible answer is that I could not, in the heat of this particular question, make a decision um, based on on just being asked that question on, on this question, but I'm not going to tell you a lie. I would find it such a difficult subject to actually vote either way, and it may just be one of those things where even in government, I would feel the need to absolutely abstain because of the fact that I could not put myself in the shoes of somebody who uh, was at such a low point uh, that they were in a position where they would want to take their own life. So I, I really can't answer. Thank you. And Ian. Yeah, this is a desperately difficult question. I've read eloquent uh, articles, testimony for people who uh, would uh, seek to end their life, who are being perhaps prevented by the law as it stands. Uh, but for my personal view, for my personal conscience, I would never want to get into a situation where uh, people taking their own life uh, at some stage in an illness was considered to be the norm. Um, I instinctively feel, despite those very eloquent and very moving uh, testimony, that this would be the top, perhaps, of a, of a slippery slope. And Whilst in an individual case, if, if somebody could convince me they were absolutely of sound mind making that decision through no pressure, uh, I may be inclined uh, for myself to agree. As a legislator, I would find it extremely hard to, uh, to codify a set of safeguards I would think sufficient to allow that step to be taken. Chair, I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment on uh, the responses to all of the questions, but it does seem to me, listening to what the candidates have said, that they've tried to respond to these questions with uh, clarity and, and integrity. Um, just within the room here, um, just to gain a sense of, of what's important to the people who live and work and study in this constituency, uh, if you were in the position of having to vote for or against such a bill, and if there were adequate safeguards in place, uh, would you be able to vote for that? Or would you feel it was right to vote against it? Or, or is there still too much we don't know? Can we just see a show of hands for voting in favour of such a bill? Thank you. And against? And don't knows? Yeah. Well, actually, it's... I'm guessing about a th third each way. And it seems to me that this is one of those issues which um, those of us of faith ought to be praying for our representatives in Parliament, both, both houses, uh, House of Commons and those who are appointed to the Lords on these kind of issues. This is not an easy one as the vote that we've just, the straw poll that we've just taken reflects. Question nine, uh, with an aging population and uh, many locally in care jobs, how will your party ensure that those who work in the care sector are better valued and paid? James, please. And it's an incredibly difficult um, question. A lot of people that are uh, primary carers aren't, aren't paid at all. Um, when I go to Southend Carers, I hear a lot more harrowing stories there than 
even the, the harrowing stories of, of private sector and state providers of care that feel that they haven't got the time and the resources to spend with, uh, with the elderly. Um, actually being able to manage um, the, not just the nation's finances in, in terms of provision, but providing secure finances uh, for others uh, to provide that care, I think is very important. Um, so that there, are, there is an ability to um, pay a fixed amount and not to get for, for not to go over. Um, so you can help fund additional uh, care. I mean, certainly the, the, the minimum wage, this is a type of area where people are being paid uh, below minimum wage, but I uh, previously prior to the minimum wage, but I am concerned about the practice I hear about of people being employed on contracts um, but aren't paid time moving between uh, area to area. So actually, uh, the amount of time that we can afford to pay and we think we're paying as a, a state isn't actually being committed to that individual. I think spending more time working out how to deal with that situation would be uh, time well spent. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, a tricky position we've got ourselves into. Um, as James alluded to, uh, a lot of the people giving care are actually giving that because they happen to be close to the person they're giving care to. Those people actually need uh, paying for giving that care. And they need paying food benefit system at the level of the minimum wage, uh, which we would set by 2020 at £10, minimum wage being a living wage. Also, those people who are currently working in care jobs, as, as Jen was generally alluded to, although this has been the, uh, the position of the last uh, two or three governments that we've had, that they've allowed this to continue, that when people are not getting paid for the journeys that they make, and they're not getting expense for mileage, and they're getting paid less for caring for people and dispensing morphine, and many of the other tasks that they do, cleaning people up when they've had accidents, um, those people not being paid, those people being paid at less than the level that somebody who serves burgers and McDonald's is an utter, utter disgrace. That disgrace has to end. We'll end it firstly by the minimum wage and secondly by ensuring the care staff get paid correctly. Ian. Thank you. I, I would agree to some extent with, with both previous speakers. I think James certainly um, um, articulated a very important point, uh, which is that uh, care assistants do not have time to properly care for people and that uh, we need to raise the value and the esteem which care workers have. It should be considered a profession, not an alternative uh, when you've tried everything else. It should be something that people can take pride in and if people are going to take <coughs> pride in it, they will need to be paid uh, a decent wage and have proper career progression, training, etc. I don't think any party has got to grips with this perhaps in the way that it should be. I think we're all going to have to get used to the fact that we will need to spend a larger proportion of our national wealth uh, in caring for our, our elderly population. Um, well, quite simply, the, the way to improve um, how uh, carers are valued is quite obviously that they've got to be paid better. Um, for those unpaid carers, the relatives and loved ones, um, the Lib Dems, uh, if they help to form a government, will give a two hundred and also investigate the, pos uh, the possibility of giving uh, a one-week um, entitlement to a holiday if you want. Um, that goes only part of the way. We've got to look at ways of increasing uh, the salary.
Thank you. <laughs> Question 10. What should the British government do to help avert the tragedy of asylum seekers <coughs> fleeing Libya and Syria, drowning in the Mediterranean? What should the British government do to help avert the tragedy of asylum seekers fleeing Libya and Syria, drowning in the Mediterranean? Simon. Australian border. I found myself uh, sat uh, silently sobbing the other day when I saw what had happened as a consequence of the absolute, totally heartless decision that had been taken Europe-wide, but in actual fact, <coughs> the first decision was taken by Britain to actually pull out a response with lifeguards along that piece of coastline about three years ago. The service was reduced to a skeleton service uh, in the last six months, and what we now see is an absolute and utter tragedy. This tragedy should not be a political football. I really, really do refuse to get into the politics of this, even though I absolutely, totally abhorred what I heard coming from UKIP this morning. What we need to do is reinvestigate the possibility of having a, pr a proper Coast Guard service to ensure that those people who are fleeing terror, those people who are fleeing death, don't meet that early death in a totally different way. We need to make sure that there's compassion and that those people are given a home. Because actually, I've worked with refugees, I've worked with asylum seekers, they don't want to live here any more than Mr. Farage wants them here. The in actual fact, they are fleeing. They are fleeing the place of their birth. In actual fact, that they fear that they will die if they don't find a place of sanctuary. I come from Sheffield. Sheffield was Britain's first city of sanctuary, and I know a little bit more than the gentleman who's trying to shout me down about no, you do not. I know you. Thank you. Thank you. Ian, please. Yeah, this is one of those issues that really shouldn't be political, yet it seems that it is. Um, if you see a child drowning, you know, what is the human reaction, you know, what, what, what should we do, you know? It seems to me obvious that we should rescue them and all other considerations uh, should, should take a back seat. Uh, I hope to go after uh, uh, James Dudridge because I was hoping as a Foreign Office Minister he might be able to un explain how this situation came about. Um, if it's true that the British government had anything to do with the decision to uh, suspend uh, the rescue, then I think that is appalling and a national disgrace. Uh, I will do whatever it takes to actually um, get the rescue restarted and extend compassion uh, basic human compassion and decency towards everybody. The, the, the answer is that the rescue patrols must restart immediately and the EU has a moral, if not legal, responsibility to do that. That is a decision that can be taken overnight. Um, if they don't start, it would be an absolute disgrace. Um, secondly, we've got to stop throwing fat on the fire. Um, these people are migrating, but not for economic reasons. Well, in the sense that, yes, they want a better life. But we've got to, and this is where it's really difficult, help sort out the political situation in those countries um, where they are fleeing from. Now, that might be as simple as just not getting involved might be going in and intervening in some shape or form in order to make the, line, you know, the scenario there better for the inhabitants so they don't flee in the first place. The first option is a lot easier than the second. James. I think this isn't just an issue about the tragic situation that we, we find ourselves in. It's much more about sorry. why people... Sorry. sorry. It's much more about... Sorry, I'll start again. Um, this isn't just a situation about the tragedy of people <coughs> uh, dying and the short-term uh, fixes around uh, rescue patrols or, or border patrols. It's looking at the, the, why people uh, are fleeing the, the, the nine miles uh, to uh, the Italian coast or, or, or Europe. Uh, most of the people that uh, come on board those boats are from er Eritrea, it's an area that I'm responsible for uh, in, in, in my responsibilities as a foreign office minister. 
we did, we're doing a lot of work uh, there trying to stabilize countries like Eritrea so there isn't a flee. In fact, Eritrea um, provides quite a significant uh, number of people in terms of asylum seekers uh, to the United Kingdom. Um, that, that this is very much part of a broader issue of growing um, the developing world out of poverty. So there is not the desire to take these enormous risks. Uh, you know, no one in their right mind, unless they're in really, really desperate situations, are going to pay vast sums of money uh, to, 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 to leave their families and take that horrendous crossing. And sometimes the people that cross over, some of the people that are most able within their communities, so it's kind of a double whammy, them, them leaving, in that they're not in their own communities to grow their own communities uh, out of poverty. Um, the, the actual original mission um, was, was a, a border patrol mission, which was an Italian mission. The question marks were over a, a European uh, mission, a rescue mission. But actually, the British government's view is actually dealing with some of these problems at source is the only long-term sustainable way. There's far too much coastline to have a permanent patrol boat that would actually cover the whole geographic right. territory. Thank you. Can, can I just ask you, uh, James, uh, you've raised that particular point. You have a particular responsibility amongst those on the panel. Uh, but the, the, the course that you've outlined, which is that one should attack the root causes of, uh, of people uh, fleeing from Eritrea, from Syria, from Libya, wherever, uh, that's a long-term issue, and people are dying now. What should happen now? Um, well, the, 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 the Mare Nostrum uh, uh, operation was an Italian issue. There is a, an emergency council meeting. I'm not sure whether it's taking place as we speak or whether it's closed. And Philip Hammond's at that, discussing those options around the possibilities of having an EU mission. But simply, you're not going to be able to cover that whole terror, territorial waters, even if there was an agreement to have rescue boats. We've got to stop people coming over. Long term, you're right, it's not going to help in the shorter term. What will help shorter term is some of the work that they'll be discussing around the EU about looking at who is driving this activity, this criminal activity, and actually giving that criminal activity the same attention we're giving terrorist activity in some of these countries and to actually really wrap up. Okay, the there's no reason not to restart the rescue patrols now. I mean, yeah. the, the, the meeting is either finished in the last hour or so, it's currently ongoing. It's, um, I, I can't remember something that's ongoing. Okay. Okay. I should know. I, I looked up on my phone to see if there was a briefing come since I've arrived. There hasn't been a briefing, so it hasn't happened. Yes, but what do you want? What do you want to say? That's odd on your opinion. What you yeah, would yeah. like. Okay, yeah. I think it's a legit. Okay, it, uh, I, I think James feels that he's already answered the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He can say, the okay, okay would you like to pick that up? What do you want? What, what I want is a short term solution which would be tackling the criminals in the same way we tackle uh, counter terrorism operations, which means a lot more focus and a lot more use of, uh, of resource across the EU. Um, on a multilateral basis and a, a unilateral basis. Um, I think there does need to be some form of uh, EU uh, solution to this. If the EU is there, we've got to use it. But I don't think uh, EU patrol boats or Italian pr pr patrol boats or UK frigates will actually solve okay. the problem in the short term. The best solution is to tackle the criminals directly and immediately with much more fervour than we have, and not seen as a border issue. Thank you. This is this is plainly a topic which, rightly, people are very animated about. Um, I think it's right that, uh, as James has had uh, a longer time to speak, others should be able to come back to it. So, Peter, J James is actually right. Um, there is a need to tackle the criminals. That's a medium-term solution. Tackling the political situation in those countries which are causing um, migrants to flee across the waters is a long-term issue. What can be done tonight yeah. is to restart those rescue missions. That's what I want to see tonight. Okay, thank you. This is actually.
actually happens as a consequence of something that happened six months ago. Six months ago, a decision was taken, and England, uh, England Britain, and uh, UK were involved in this decision, and so were the Germans, and so were the French, so it's not just us, to actually withdraw a significant amount of funding from Mare Nostrum. While Mare Nostrum were patrolling that coast, with that significant funding, they ran boat patrols day and night across there, and these sort of tragedies didn't happen. But the point is, these are not immigrants, these are not refugees, a thousand people have died. They are people. A lot of them were children and babies. They were fleeing terror. People, put people first, please. Okay, thank you. I agree with Simon. These, these are people. We need to see them as, as people. Um, the idea that a, a rescue uh, service may not be 100% successful is, in my opinion, no argument for not attempting it. Uh, that, uh, do, doing that does not in any way preclude us, preclude us from pursuing the, the long and medium term goals, which James is quite right on. You know, it, it's not a tenable situation, it's not something that we can sustain permanently. Uh, but right now people are dying and it's our moral responsibility to act. Thank you. We, uh, we come now to our final three questions and we'll go back to just a minute for, this, uh, for these, uh, each of these. Um, no deviation or hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what are your views on fracking? What are your views on fracking? Ian. Thank you. Uh, the amendments which the Labour Party proposed to the, the bill which has gone through Parliament effectively uh, bans fracking in large parts of the country. It bans it in national parks or anywhere where the water is likely uh, to feed into the water supply. Uh, personally, I think there's a, a case for going further than that and banning it outright. Although there are one or two similar, similar procedures which which do happen and have happened for a while without, uh, without, um, with, without any comments. Um, I nevertheless think that this, this heavy duty industrial uh, fracturing uh, of rocks is, is um, seen to have very negative uh, impacts uh, in the US. Uh, and I think there is a very strong case for halting any activity of that type until, the, until it's been okay. fully investigated. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. I, I'm very, very nervous about it. Um, I need to be really persuaded that it's safe. Currently, I'm not. I think we should be investing more in renewable energy, wind farms, uh, solar panels, uh, ground source heat pumps, all the rest of it. It is just too dangerous. The, the technology uh, has not been proven here. It's a short-term fix, and we've got to stop this short-termism. You've got to look long term and aim to get that uh, zero carbon economy by 2050. We will not do it through fracking. James? I don't think fracking is the, the big answer. I think the big answer is the renewables uh, piece going forward. But I do think fracking is part of the short to medium uh, term future. Uh, well, two issues really. One, uh, because of energy security, and you see the situation in terms of the Ukraine, um, and the other is in terms of price. I mean, one of the big political issues people talk to me about is the cost of commuting, the cost of getting around my car, the cost of oil, and actually freeing up other sources of energy that will come online faster, I think, is part of the mix. There are concerns uh, about uh, the safety, which is why it should be done slowly alongside the science. But I think it is part of the short to medium term solution, but isn't the longer term solution. Thank you. And Simon. As you can probably imagine, I've actually read uh, in excess of 100,000 pages of information on fracking. Uh, I can't disseminate all that. I can give you five hours on fracking if you like. I've only got a minute. I'll give you two points. First of all, fracking has been shown everywhere it's been done to absolutely and totally destroy the water table. No more fresh water, poison your kids. Second point, all across America it has created ghost towns. 
Fracking creates ghost towns. If you want ghost towns where nothing will ever grow again, go for fracking. Also, one final thing, psychologically, breaking holes in bedrock shale causes subsidence. If you want your house to fall into a hole, go pro fracking. And I've read about it, believe me. On, on the evidence available to the general public that we have, are you at the moment in favour of allowing fracking to go ahead, or against it, or don't know? Those in favour? Okay. Those against? <laughs> and don't knows? Okay. Well, it, those against carry the day. Uh, and with a fair few don't knows as well. So something perhaps for uh, the panel to reflect on uh, in the days to come. Uh, question 12. What one policy or statement from your party would you now reverse if you had the chance? What one policy or statement from your party would you now reverse if you had the chance? Simon. This is fairly easy for me. I'm a big believer in choice, so are the Green Party. I think a, a little policy that they've tried to enact in Brighton that failed miserably, meat free Fridays. People want to eat meat, that's for their conscience. I'm personally a vegetarian, but in actual fact, there are some people that eat meat, don't take pleasure from it. Uh, I'd reverse the meat free Fridays. With regard to this current manifesto, nothing. I wouldn't change it. Ian. I think that uh, one of the, the biggest mistakes of, that the last Labour government made was to uh, go too far in terms of introducing uh, competition uh, into the National Health Service. Uh, I'd like to. Uh, I, I, think Andy I think Andy Burnham, when he was Health Secretary, did start to put it right. I'd like to go further. Uh, I'm not saying no private involvement in the NHS anywhere yeah. ever. But I do certainly think that um, publicly run, uh, publicly funded, and free at the point of delivery health services is the way to go. Peter. Uh, for me, it was the decision uh, during the last parliament to go for the alternative vote referendum. Uh, unfortunately, I thought that was the biggest waste of money going. Um, if as Lib Dems, we can't beat you at your own game by having a first-past-the-post system, then we shouldn't beat that. Um, when, eventually, one day, hopefully there will be a, a majority Lib Dem government, we should then bring in full proportional representation. <laughs> and then parties such as the Green Party, who obviously have a lot of support, <coughs> for whom I have a great deal of respect, will hear their voice heard. So, for me, it was the AV vote. I think we should be aiming for full proportional representation, and then your view will be heard. <laughs> and James. Um, I believe all individuals are, are, are equal, regardless of their, their race, religion, um, or sexuality. And I think my party is still blighted by the statement of some in the 1970s that didn't think people, British citizens that were uh, not white with both parents coming from the UK were equal citizens. Question 13. Which one of your party's policies would best enable Rochford and Southend to flourish as places in which to live, work or study? James. Getting uh, the economy back on track, plain and simple. Keep the budget deficit coming down, start repaying the debts, uh, the, the, the debt in uh, 2018. Thank you. Thank you. Admirable brevity in the final stretches of the, uh, of the debate. Simon Green, Simon for the Greens. Um, I think one of the most uh, the important central core policies and something I've heard people in Rochford talk about is the fact that there are homeless people in Rochford, believe it or not. Uh, there's quite a few of them, and I think that our uh, safe, warm uh, housing policy uh, is, is, is probably core to making things better uh, within uh, South Indies and Rockford. 
But I also believe that this housing has to be built in the right place. It has to be the right type of development. Uh, they have to be houses that will house the people that are trying to downsize, the people that are part of the aging population. So it has to be appropriately built in the right place, warm, safe housing. That's probably the policy that will uh, benefit the future of this area. As well. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Ian. Uh, well, we've talked about the NHS, uh, so I'm going to go for housing on this question. Um, I think um, uh, places, th th this part of the town in particular, is, is blighted by poor quality housing. Um, some policies which I think will help in that is a register of all landlords, so we at least know who's responsible for these properties. Um, secure tenancies uh, in the private sector, long, promoting longer tenancies, so when people move uh, into a place they know they're going to have a stake in that community, not just until for six months until the landlord changes their mind, but for the long term, uh, and to limit uh, extortionate rent rises and extortionate letting agent fees, which uh, makes life very difficult for those people who can't afford to buy their own house. Yeah. I'm not averse to agreeing with my political opponents. Um, unfortunately, it's the same answer as James. It's reducing the uh, deficit by uh, the year 2718. As I said before, um, as Bill Clinton said, it's the economy speaking. Ed, not to just see anybody stupid. The, um, the, the simple, very, very simple fact of life is without the DOSH, you've got nothing. And we were put in a position um, in 2010, and we've got to come back from that. The work has started, it's got to continue. And beyond 2018, that's when um, we will be running a circuit and we'll be able to invest even more into all those things that you care about. The NHS, absolutely fundamental. The education of our children, absolutely fundamental. Without the money in the bank, we can't do it. And what's important about the deficit is that if you bring the structural deficit down, you also bring the national debt down. And long term, that is the most important thing. Thank you. Well, We've covered 13 questions over quite a wide area, but it's important that the candidate should have just one last opportunity to set out their stall. Uh, there will be maybe issues that we haven't touched on in the questions. So, uh, for no longer than two minutes, if you would just like, simply like to, uh, to put forward uh, the basis on which we should vote for you uh, as, uh, as a candidate. And we'll begin uh, with Ian. I'll stand up for this. Well, thank you all very much for those uh, questions which have been extremely challenging uh, and interesting. Um, as I said, I'm somebody who, who's lived here for a long time and cares about this, this area and this community. Um, we've seen Labour councillors elected to South End can make a, a difference. Um, I think I can make a difference as a Member of Parliament. Um, we've spoken about the NHS, we've spoken about housing. Um, I actually want to talk about, um, as I've not got very long, to go back to that, that point about um, policing uh, and we need to bring back proper uh, neighbourhood policing where local police actually have the trust of their communities uh, and to put more, more police back on the beat because we've seen some of the terrible incidents that happen around here. Um, so yeah, NHS, police, housing, uh, I believe we've got the right policies to take this town forward. Thank you. As I said before, I'm not a professional politician. Um, I'm actually quite fed up with professional politicians. I believe, um, getting uh, direct to the point, I'm very much a pragmatist. I've been an army officer. I've spent most of my working life uh, in the army, but I've also had um, experience in other fields. I was in, uh, in the automotive industry here in South End at um, Progress Road. I also worked in investment banking. Uh, I've worked for small businesses and large businesses. So I've got the experience 
to um, fight for what uh, you want in the South End. Um, I've been, uh, when I was in the army, I served in the Falklands. Um, I know you can't believe that because I look so young. Um, I also was in Afghanistan in 2009. So I know what it's like. I know that, um, and there would be nothing that would give me greater pleasure um, than if we were able to solve some of those very dire uh, foreign uh, policy issues. Um, the, the thing for me is, um, I've generally always been the underdog. So I very much identify with those who are uh, uh, weaker in society, who need somebody to help them along, to give them the opportunities. And that's why I'm a Lib Dem, because we're in the middle, we fight for those things that are fair, we fight for opportunity for everyone. Thank you. James, please. Thank you. I, reflecting, I've been a, a politician for 10 years, so I, I turned to Ian when everyone's been talking about uh, professional politicians. I said, am I a professional politician now? And he turned to me without missing a heartbeat and he said, well, it would be better than being an unprofessional one. <laughs> so thank you for that joke. He said I could use it as long as I credited it with him. So all, my, all, all the good humour is him and all the mistakes of mine. Apologies. Um, it is an amazing job being a Member of Parliament, one that I want to carry on doing. It's an amazing job because you can help individual constituents learn from that experience and change legislation through the party system. Um, it, it is great, particularly looking elsewhere around the world, uh, where they don't have the same level of democracy. They might have some of the words that we associate with democracy, with elections and, and voting and process and commons or senates, but they don't actually have the same checks and balances that we do. It's a great thing to, to be involved in, and you can make much more of a contribution than any other walk of life. Um, and I would ask you to re-elect me to do that role. Re-elect me to do that role because I think I've got the right balance between being a campaigning MP on issues, dealing with local issues um, for individuals, but also uh, doing the business on a national stage. And in my current role as a, a Foreign Office Minister, in my other role previously as a, a party whip, uh, coordinating individuals to produce policies that are right for the nation. Um, and that's an important part. You can't take politics out of politics. Um, I'd like to do that, that, that job, um, but more importantly than me asking you to vote for James Dudridge, vote for David Cameron to run the economy for the next five years in 10 Downing Street. Let's finish the job together. Let's continue. We've got a long-term economic plan. We started delivering. Let's finish the job together. Thank you. Thank you. I finally get to stand up. <laughs> and funnily enough, I'm going to have the last word again. Right, where do we start? The elderly, the disabled, NHS key workers, the working who have to use food banks, people from other countries seeking asylum in this country, people who are not so well off, people who live in rural communities. Now I've read five manifestos and I'll tell you something, it's a tough job but somebody has to do it. Four of them look, feel and smell exactly the same. One of them shines out like a bright green beacon. <laughs> if you want something different to happen to this country and something that will work for the benefit of all those groups of people I've mentioned and all the ones that I didn't, you need to vote green. Thank you. Well, I hope you feel it's been a useful evening, an enjoyable evening, that you've heard some uh, responses that have cheered or challenged you. I want to say thank you to those who supplied the questions. Apologies to those que uh, questioners whose uh, suggestions we weren't able to use because we had so many submitted. I want to thank Bellevue Baptist Church for so kindly hosting us tonight, to you, members of the public, for coming along, and 
Would you join with me in thanking our panel for being with us tonight?